So the meeting is now open to the public and um, in the room today we have myself, Emma Shear, in the chair. We have Mike Nesbitt, the vice chair, and Paula Bradshaw. And we have Mark Durkin joining us via Starleaf. Uh, can I remind members that the committee meeting will be recorded and broadcast throughout Parliament buildings and online. We uh, are waiting on, we've got John O'Dowd just joined us and we're waiting on Michelle McElveen. So the first item on our agenda is apologies and we have received apologies this week from Christopher Stalford who, who isn't present. So the, the second item, and I'm very uh, delighted to welcome um, our Mr Justice Richard Humphreys, I know you prefer to be um, spoken to informally, so Richard, it's very nice to have you in the room. It's a, a rare, tweet and, rare treat in 2020 to have someone here in present uh, presenting to us. <laughs> Thanks so, very much, Emma. Glad to be here. Of course. So, uh, if you... Oh, Mark, you're not mute. <laughs> <'Cause>, <laughs> stop him just, <laughs> just in time, maybe. Um, so... Uh, Richard is a judge of the High Court in Ireland, a graduate of UCD and King's Inns, and hold, holds a PhD in law from Trinity College Dublin. He was a practising barrister between 1997 and 2015 and was appointed to the High Court in 2015. In the 1990s, he was a Labour Party councillor in the 26th and a government special advisor. He attended the launch of the multi-party negotiations that led to the 1998 Good Friday Agreement as a specialist advisor. So, uh, Richard, we've received your written briefing and members can find that beginning at page five of their packs. And if you want to begin, thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much, Emma. Well, um, can I just start by saying um, I'm very grateful for the invitation and I think no matter what comes out of the committee's work, I think you'll have done a fantastic job in... Uh, bringing this issue to the fore and examining it, uh, because it's an important issue that um, certainly needs to be discussed. So, if we go to the next slide, then I'm just uh, want to, I just want to uh, put down one caveat, which is I'm neutral on all the political questions. I'm neutral on the constitutional issue. I'm not advocating anything. Um, I'm not neutral on reconciliation and accommodation. So, from that point of view, I'm saying that. Uh, whatever solutions would make Northern Ireland a more healed and harmonious place uh, would be something that I'd be encouraging uh, your committee to look at. Um, now, you've had the Lord Chief Justice and the invitation to me, I think, originally came to engage with the committee originally came through our Chief Justice. So with two Chief Justices on board, I can rely on the Bangalore principles that judges can talk to parliamentary committees on uh, uh, law-related matters. Um, so if we go to the um, next slide, then uh, I just want to make the obvious point, perhaps, that the uh, Bill of Rights is as PUL as it gets. Uh, this is William of Orange and Queen Mary having the Bill of Rights presented to them for the Royal Assent. Uh, if we move on, then, um, talk, let's talk about options. And I just want to clarify, uh, I'm not here to offer you any solutions. Um, I, I, I can't think I say is a question. Um, uh, not as a, a fixed view, um, but what I'm suggesting maybe is there are a couple of things that you could um, uh, look at. First of all, I think the pros and cons of a Bill of Rights, just as a matter of principle. Now, you know, I think you've had a lot of witnesses and evidence talking about, okay, the detail and would it cover socio-economic rights and all the micro-specific stuff. But I think it's worth kind of rewinding to the very basic question, is this a good idea or not? Um, and tease that out a bit. Then the options in terms of issues like scope, methodology, enforcement, how you would actually go about it in terms of consultations, inputs, the work of your committee. And really what I'm suggesting, and take it only as a suggestion, is that any kind of very firm recommendations really would only arise if you've dealt with kind of those initial matters, uh, really discussing whether it's a good idea, what the what the options are without recommending any of them and, and the methodology of getting there. So if we move on then to the pros and cons in principle, what, what I'm suggesting really is, you know, rather than kind of assume that there has to be uh, some particular solution, let's have a, an honest discussion about whether it is a good idea. Uh, I'm very fond of quoting the American economist Thomas Sowell, who says that there are no solutions, only trade-offs. Everything has pros and cons. And I just wonder about selling any proposal on a Bill of Rights if you haven't fully prepared the ground 
uh, for that. And the ground has to be prepared in some detail at the level of basic principle. So my suggestion, and again, take it only as a suggestion, is that the very first thing to do before making any substantive recommendations is publish some kind of discussion paper on whether the whole thing in principle is a good idea or not, or at least what the pros and cons are, so that there can be a kind of a engagement, public engagement with that at the level of, of principle and what it's meant to achieve. So then if we go on to the next slide, what are the pros? Well, there are a lot of pros. Uh, it could play a role in reconciliation and accommodation. Um, it is obviously by definition bills of rights and similar instruments are anti-majoritarian, so they protect minorities. And given that every side is a minority now in a 40-40-20 society, um, there's benefits there for everybody. Uh, that could be even more important in the future. Uh, there is potentially something in it for the PUL identity slash the British identity as well as the Irish identity. Um, by enhancing human rights, you're going to promote uh, a rights-based legal culture and better protection for individuals. And then you have other options, such as it could be balanced with fundamental duties, uh, for example, which are also an important part of the equation. Legal rights of individuals are the same thing as duties on the state. They're just two sides of the one coin. But what's sometimes missing from that discussion is the duties of individuals, uh, things like paying your taxes and complying with the law and respecting the rights of others. Um, so those fundamental duties um, really need to be factored in as part of a kind of balanced analysis of the issue. And then finally, well, this is something I'm sort of particularly um, sympathetic to and would, would suggest for consideration, maybe more in the medium term, is that a Bill of Rights could be part of a broader constitution for Northern Ireland um, that could provide stability uh, in the face of, of quite a degree of possible turbulence from various um, situations. Now, when I say constitution for Northern Ireland, I mean respecting the constitutional arrangements in Northern Ireland. We're talking about a Northern Ireland Constitution Act, which would be an act of the Westminster Parliament, but bringing together the constitutional law of Northern Ireland. So now the cons. Now, I find, um, considering almost anything, when you make a list of pros and cons, the cons list is almost always longer. Uh, but it, it doesn't mean that something isn't worth doing. Um, what are the cons? And again, this is one, what I mean by an honest discussion about it. Let's recognize them and get them out on the table. Uh, the first one, obviously, is we've been here before. Um, this has a very long history. Uh, we're still talking about it decades later. The demand for a Bill of Rights is, is not evenly balanced across the community. Well, that's an empirical observation. Feel free to disagree with me, but I'm, I'm not sure it is evenly balanced at the moment. Um, Removing issues from political decision could be an advantage, but on the other hand, it could be a disadvantage, because as soon as you define something as a right, you're taking away the option of compromise, uh, of negotiation, of political solutions. Um, now, admittedly, rights aren't always entirely 100% black and white. There's room for qualifications, adjustments, and so forth. But the more something is moved into the space of rights, the more it's taken out of the realm of political agreement and negotiation and um, just let's not pretend that there isn't an issue there, um, a delicate issue to be considered. Okay, and what about getting the courts involved? Well, courts are unpredictable, that's a definite con. Um, courts can handle commutative justice reasonably well. What, by commutative justice, I mean um, two cars knock into each other and one citizen is suing another citizen, um, a, a bank is suing somebody, um, to, to recover a loan, something like that. But courts are not well equipped to deal with distributive justice in the sense of distributing the resources, the community among uh, the range of citizens generally and members of the community generally. Um, they're not good at that for a whole lot of reasons. Uh, judges have no training for that kind of thing. Their professional life is all about the individual case. It's not about allocating resources in society as a whole. Uh, courts don't have access to the instruments, the data that governments uh, and ministers have, uh, parliaments have. Um, they, uh, and they don't have the mindset. I mean, I think that's another important thing. Courts very much focus on the people in front of them. Uh, and they're, if I were to make an empirical observation, generally bad at factoring the rights in the rights of people who are not before the court, 
Um, so, for instance, traditionally in a criminal case, it was all about the prosecution and the defendant and the victim was invisible. Now, that has changed, of course, to some extent, partly due to European law. Um, but the principle is there. In other words, if you're not before the court, the court actually isn't that great at recognising your interests. And I think that would be a major problem in, um, in widening the whole justice ability, the justiciability of, of the more um, social and economic rights. Uh, Okay, Bill of Rights wouldn't satisfy everybody, so, you know, which would, could, it, could it create a kind of an ongoing demand? Um, it wouldn't, inverted commas, solve anything. It would just sort of set up a new front for uh, discussion. Could it become uh, lawfare, in inverted commas? Okay, a pejorative term, but what, what people generally mean by that is politics by other means. So if you can't get your legislation through the uh, legislature, you just uh, march down to the High Court and... Um, achieve your result that way. Now, sometimes, of course, that's a good thing if, in fact, the state in whatever its manifestation is actually violating people's rights. It's good to have a, a, a check and a balance. But on the other hand, it can't just lace the political system altogether. Possible pushback from Westminster if entrenchment went beyond NI specific matters. Okay, I think we can delete the word possible there. Um, I mean, I'm sort of semi-jokingly calling that a human rights border in the Irish Sea. Uh, just to use the kind of fashionable argo of the day. Uh, in, other words, um, in other words, if we're talking about Northern Ireland specific matters, that's one thing. If we're talking about a kind of whole panoply of international human rights uh, protection, there's an issue in terms of the internal architecture of United Kingdom constitutional law. Um, the economic, social, cultural rights jurisdiction could politicise the, ju the judiciary. Um, Again, it's hard to predict, and it would depend on how it was set up. And I suppose, finally, one could argue that there's less need for a Bill of Rights when there are all of the cross-community safeguards. You know, in a normal kind of parliamentary situation, 50% plus one of the members of the legislature can pass whatever they want, subject to a kind of an overarching constitution, whereas here it's, it's different. Okay, so if we move on then to the options, um, and we're looking here at issues like scope, methodology, and enforceability. So th the next slide then is scope. Um, if we go on to the next one there. Um, and again, this depends on how broad you want to draw it. Um, as I've said, you could, you could go very broad and balance the rights with fundamental duties or, or broader still and work towards an overall Constitution Act for Northern Ireland. Well, there is a 1998 Act, but I mean, there's lots of other constitutional legislation as well. So the maximalist version would be all rights in international law minus what's already there in the Human Rights Act. In between, you could work off the various um, Northern Ireland related agreements, and then you could have something more limited and in Northern Ireland specific, um, focusing perhaps on rights that would contribute to accommodation. Uh, another of my favourite quotes is from Isaac Newton, do a little with certainty and leave the rest for others that come after you. Um, so just because it isn't the maximum version doesn't mean it isn't worth doing. Um, in terms of scope of rights in my part of the island, um, the 1937 constitution, um, despite its age, did anticipate a lot of subsequent developments in uh, human rights law. The economic and social rights are relatively aspirational, haven't really featured much in the case law. Uh, the courts have sort of filled any gaps by creating this doctrine of unenumerated rights. In other words, that um, the courts can say that uh, they can imply rights in the text of the constitution that aren't specifically set out. And that did go into decline, has a lot of critics, um, but it has sort of, hasn't completely gone away. The Court of Appeal this year um, uh, upheld a new um, unenumerated right in a case called Habte. Uh, by pure coincidence, they were upholding a decision of mine um, finding that uh, right to exist, uh, which is a right to have your identity correctly recognised by the state. But that's one decision. There are other decisions that are quite sceptical of unenumerated rights, but the doctrine is there. But now we're reasonably well supplied with charters of rights in our part of the island because not only do you have the constitution and not only do you have the unenumerated rights that aren't written in the constitution, we have the European Convention on Human Rights Act, which is broadly based on the UK Human Rights Act, and we also have the uh, European Charter. Uh, admittedly, that only applies within the scope of EU law, but the scope of EU law is so wide and so pervasive nowadays that um, it does actually come into quite a lot of cases. 
So then if we look at um, methodology, well, you know, again, maybe this is stating the obvious. You can kind of do the grand design and the big bang, or you can do kind of um, small items uh, working up towards um, an overall plan, and perhaps it's easier to build on something than nothing. Um, so then if we go on to the next slide, um, the methodology in Ireland, um, so the 1937 constitution, well, in my part of the island, I mean, is a, um, it is quite overarching. It's relatively comprehensive on the civil and political rights front. Um, it is hard to amend uh, in the sense you need a referendum. And you also need the referendum to be passed, which has turned out to be a bigger problem than uh, as <laughs> necessarily always anticipated. Uh, we've had a lot of constitutional reviews in the South, and most of them have ended in failure. Um, uh, you know, people do say, oh, uh, Iceland is great with the crowdsourced constitution, and Ireland is great with its citizen assemblies, and so on. But in fact, in reality, it doesn't, it doesn't work out that way. You know, the Iceland example ended in complete failure. Their document wasn't adopted. And if you go through all the various Irish reports, the vast majority of the recommendations made for constitutional change have not been recommended. There have been the few exceptions, and of course they get celebrated, the successes, but there are far more failures uh, than successes. That's just an empirical observation. Um, so, for example, the 1967 uh, review resulted in absolutely nothing. Um, I mean, it anticipated the Good Friday Agreement, but it was way ahead of its time. Um, 1995, pretty much nothing. 1997, there were about 10 uh, parliamentary reports, and uh, nothing particularly much came of them. Um, Constitutional Convention, nine proposals made, one of them was passed, and then you had the Citizens' Assembly. Uh, the abortion issue, of course, did get proposed and was passed, so therefore everyone said, oh, well, this shows the, just shows how the, um, these Citizens' Assemblies contribute uh, to uh, things changing, but um, I think you would need to stand back and look at the bigger picture, and in fact, the bigger picture is very much one of uh, failure, quite frankly, uh, if you want to use that term. Uh, the 1937 constitution is, um, you know, still somewhat outdated, as say, the 1930s mindset, still very much there, uh, needs reform, but it's very hard to, it's a very hard document to change. Okay, entrenchment. By entrenchment, I mean, I mean I'm not sure what other people mean by entrenchment, but what I mean by entrenchment is something that the assembly can't unscramble and change. Uh, in other words, it has to be uh, signed off at West Westminster. Um, and obviously that's going to be an issue if you're going to go much beyond the Northern Ireland uh, specific matters. Um, next slide then. So you could have some lesser sort of Bill of Rights uh, that doesn't necessarily involve Westminster involvement. You say a presumption that um, the rights in the Act are not affected by ordinary statutes. Um, interpret, the, interpret other statutes so far as possible in accordance with the Bill of Rights, or the very kind of soft version like the rights of the child legislation in Wales. So these are rights which decision makers should take into account. Um, or you could have totally soft law, so non-statutory uh, guidance. So there are a kind of range of, of options there, as you, um, uh, as you know. But uh, again, I go back to my point that uh, you know, the maximalist version isn't the only uh, version that's worth considering. So then if we go on then, um, this is just one uh, possible um, question for your consideration is, do you have to have the same enforceability for everything? I mean, there are, there are, um, there are uh, rights and corresponding duties that are of crucial importance to, to Northern Ireland. Uh, people's right to be treated equally, I suppose, above all else perhaps. Um, and the parity of esteem that's kind of at the heart of, of the future for Northern Ireland um, and, and a harmonious and healed future. And that kind of right is really kind of too important to be sort of left in, in massive doubt. Um, that isn't true of socio and economic rights, which by their very definition are, are um, progressive rights and they're something that can evolve and uh, develop uh, depending on um, depending on issues like resources and the state of society. So variable geometry is an option. I mean, going right back to the Government of Ireland Act 1920, the uh, duty to not to discriminate on religious grounds was written in by Westminster into Northern Ireland's sort of title deeds, if I can use that expression. Um, 
Uh, so that concept of an entrenchment of a, a duty of equality and a right to, to equal treatment is, uh, was there from the very outset. Uh, as far as the 26 counties are concerned, okay, well, we don't have, this isn't really so much of an issue because we're sort of used to the idea that uh, laws are very much an inferior thing. The constitution takes priority in all circumstances and if the law is one millimeter out of place, it's invalid. Um, in practice though, that doesn't really happen very much. Um, the, reason being, the reason being the interpretative presumptions. The presumption is you interpret legislation in a manner that's constitutional if you can. You, um, we call that the, the presumption of constitutionality. There's a case called East Donegal, which is one of the most famous Irish constitutional cases. There's the European Union law principle established in the Marleson case that you interpret legislation in a, in a manner compatible with EU law if you can do. And then we also have an interpretative presumption about the ECH law, which is very similar to uh, what you have in the, and based on what you have in the Westminster Human Rights Act. In other words, if you can in, interpret it in accordance with the European Convention, you do that insofar as possible. So when you bring together all those presumptions, generally courts will be able to say, well, you know, we can read this act. If there is a right at issue, we can read the act in a manner that gives effect to the right. So striking down legislation is, is relatively unusual, uh, certainly these days anyway. Um, but obviously there are limits. I mean, there's no, you, legislation doesn't get struck down on the basis of the socio and economic rights generally in Article 45 because um, there's a specific clause that, uh, uh, um, excludes essentially review on the basis of validity in those cases and then where international human rights law hasn't been incorporated in legislation uh, there's no obligation on decision makers to have regard to it. So then if I move on to my kind of procedural methodological sort of heading how do you go about the whole thing and I know you have uh, launched your consultation exercise which is great and um, you know, the, the more of that kind of thing and the more sort of consultation discussion you can kind of have, I think the better. Um, as I say, you could say there's no magic solution or you could say there's an open opportunity to be the best. Um, Iceland, uh, great and all as it was, was a failure. Irish um, reforms, most of them have failed. Um, uh, I did speak at one of the constitutional conventions and I did, I did find it, I certainly wouldn't be the only person to say this, quite secretariat-led. In other words, uh, something can look like it's a very open source kind of very democratic thing, but in fact, um, when you randomly select sort of a limited number of people, um, they're very much dependent on the secretariat to kind of determine what the agenda is and so forth. Now, that's not a criticism, it's just an empirical observation. Um, in other words, you can't sort of bypass the whole you can't bypass the process of selection and consideration of what the issues are simply by saying we're going to kind of create a, a sort of a random selection of people to tell us what the answers are. Um, the next generation have got to have a, a say on this as well. Um, yeah, there was a, there have been a couple of exercises, I think, around the, uh, um, ar around the uh, commemoration of the Magna Carta a couple of years ago where young people were being asked to say, well, if you're writing Magna Carta now, what would it look like and so forth. So I think young people's voices have got to be very, very important. And then you, your consultation exercises and your polling and I I indicative uh, polls and so forth of, of, you know, maybe could have a role. Um, again, no, um, no magic solution. Okay, if we go on to the next one then. Maybe one thing that would help would be a law uh, commission. Okay, I say this as a member of the Irish Law Reform Commission, but um, uh, even Jersey has a law commission. You've got the English, Scottish and Irish uh, work together. Um, in Northern Ireland, there is a kind of a lack of a space for constructive cross-community legal dialogue anyway. I'm not sure where else uh, lawyers are kind of talking to each other about practical things that are going to help. Um, but a, a law commission would definitely be a help. That's uh, one for the justice minister um, I think has responsibility for reactivating that. I mean, it's there on the statute books and I think it officially has one member at the moment, but it isn't functioning. Um, so what would, the, what would the options look like? And again, I go back to my point, I'm not specifically recommending anything to you. We're just talking about options. Um, so make the problem smaller is an obvious one. Uh, what's the common ground? 
Um, I've made that maybe provocatively small there in the picture, but um, uh, focus perhaps on what um, can be clearly seen to be of kind of mutual benefit to everybody. Okay, the other option, and you know, I have to say it's one I personally think should get uh, a more um, serious consideration in the in the medium term, is make the problem bigger. With a, a Northern Irish Constitution Act to um, a Westminster piece of legislation to bring together all the constitutional law in Northern Ireland. Uh, I mean, I'm, all the constitutional law I'm talking about. Um, so institutions of government, the possible Bill of Rights, um, institutions of local government, civil society rights, uh, the overarching uh, financial legislation, and uh, perhaps a balancing provision on fundamental duties. Um, I think it would. I think a Northern Irish Constitution Act would do something to um, provide some greater sense of kind of stability, and it would provide a balance. Uh, in other words, if it would provide a mechanism whereby um, some sections could bring their wishes to the table, and then that could be balanced by other sections of the community, and it might do something to kind of deflect from this sort of sense of. Um, I suppose, uh, provisionality and kind of churn, um, particularly at the constitutional level, um, so that we'd be saying, look, uh, we can have a kind of mature discussion. This is the kind of society uh, we want to have on a, um, on a sort of more um, ongoing basis. Um, and it's not the case that the kind of institutions of state are just up there for kind of re permanent renegotiation. Uh, so it might provide that sense of stability um, and um, reassurance, perhaps, that might contribute to uh, good relations. So if we go on then to the next one, OK, my conclusion, a lot of moving parts. Um, my suggestion, really, for all it's worth, is uh, maybe consider publishing a, a short paper on the pros and cons, uh, the very basic issue or principle. Uh, so there can be a discussion on that rather than kind of rush straight into something where people don't necessarily accept the premise of the whole discussion. In other words, we have to, um, what's the point in discussing the fine detail of a Bill of Rights if there are going to be a very substantial number of people who say, sorry, what are we talking about? Why are we having a Bill of Rights? So we need to, have, we need to be clear on what it's meant to achieve um, and possibly then maybe separately uh, what the options are. So look, I'm not pushing either a Bill of Rights specifically or any particular version of a Bill of Rights. What I am pushing, uh, if, you, if I can say that, is whatever would make, would help make Northern Ireland in practice uh, become a more healed and harmonious place. Um, and, and that is essentially my um, fundamental suggestion to you. So my final slide, I think, is just to say um, thank you very much uh, for having me. Uh, and um, I'm happy to answer any um, questions, obviously. Thank you, Emma. Thank you very much, Richard, for the presentation and um, for the written contribution you gave us. One of the points that you made in, in one of the first slides was um, the importance you placed on sort of having the pros and cons listed for the population in any Bill of Rights that this committee might contribute to or whatever way we, we get to a Bill of Rights, if we get to having a Bill of Rights for the North. Um, and you mentioned then that we're doing a consultation on that. And I, I just wondered, it's sort of my own perception that for us to do this consultation and uh, as we push it through the community and try to try to access people and say what rights are about and to, to make it accessible and that people understand what this is and to get their, their views. Does that satisfy the requirement of having the pros and cons listed clearly to, to the public for you? Well, um, I mean, I had to look at your um, questionnaire, um, and again, I, I think it's a great idea. And as I, as I said at the start, I think the whole work of the committee is an excellent idea, no matter what way it evolves, because this, this is a, a really important issue that, that needs to be discussed. Um, but look, I, I mean, I think in your, quest, in your existing consultation, there was a certain amount of kind of detail about what the end product would, would look like. Um, and I suppose I'm, I'm saying that's absolutely great and let's talk about that. But maybe separately or even first, let's, let's talk about the very basic issue um, uh, as to whether this is worth doing at all. Now, I think on balance, um, well, look, you saw my list of pros and cons. 
Um, and I think, I think, um, I, I think I personally would would look at teasing that out as a standalone kind of a thing. In other words, as an issue of principle, as a kind of first step. Um, let's have the discussion because otherwise you, you might end up getting some way ahead of um, a, a fairly significant section of your target audience and of the community. Yeah, it's it's communicating and I suppose how we communicate to people and how we reach everyone, you know, a, a, across the population of the North and, and break down any buyers that there may be in terms of what the perception of rates are or what this whole process is about. No, so totally. But I think th things can get reduced to a soundbite, and that's that's necessary <laughs> at one level in terms of political communication. I do understand that, but you can lose something in the discussion. In other words, if you say, well, this is about rights for everybody, that's great. But I go back to my point, there are no solutions, only trade-offs. What are you, what are you um, giving up or what are you risking in order to do that? And you're, uh, that very much depends on a lot of factors such as um, to what extent the courts are going to be involved, are you withdrawing issues from the parliamentary space? In other words, look, Emma, there's no such thing as a free lunch. That's essentially what I'm saying. Um, yes, uh, let's have rights, and I'm saying that from you know, somebody in the South, where say, we have very extensive charters of rights, sure, of course. Um, very few people in our part of the island would disagree with the concept, but how you how you implement it, I think, I think you need an honest discussion about what the trade-offs are, and um, therefore you have to make a judgment about whether this particular kind of initiative uh, is better on balance uh, or not. And I think, you know, if you're, if you're confident in your case, um, but I think it's one that needs to be made expressly. I think that the, one of the last points that you made is key, that there is a perception there that this is a zero-sum argument. When you talk about the trade-offs, and the things that might be lost, to me, and and from what you have said, I would perceive that to be the only people that would be losing are the politicians or the, the you know, the general public don't set aren't set to, to lose in rates being extended to everyone. But if, I think maybe the perception for some is that they would, um, where it's it's the lawmakers that are going to have increased responsibility, are going to have um, increased sort of commitments to adhere to um, and I don't know I don't know how we, we get that out but no and I think I think historically and internationally this is why charters of rights tend to get enacted at times of major change uh, South Africa uh, become, becoming a, a free um, country Irish uh, independence uh, people adopt charters of rights when there's a, a brand new vista and uh, people aren't giving up existing powers if you like they're creating a new a society, but when you're when you're trying to sort of superimpose that on an existing society and an existing kind of power structure, um, it becomes a more complex um, operation. I think um, Tony Blair, I think, uh, expressed regret at some later stage for having enacted some of his legislation that tied the hands of the government. I think the Freedom of Information Act, particularly. But having said that, I can understand why he might have had regrets about it. But it is an excellent piece of legislation from a practical point of view, and maybe a good example of how rights can be upheld in, in practice. Um, uh, so, is it just would the citizen lose any rights? I mean. I think, you know, I, I do have to go back to the point that they, there is no such thing as a free lunch. A, a right does carry a duty, even on the citizen. So if you create a right, you're creating an obligation on other citizens to respect that right when exercised by other people, um, uh, even if that involves paying for it, for example. So you create a right to a free X, Y, or Z, therefore the taxpayer has to contribute to that. Now, it's not a, the individual taxpayer doesn't have to contribute a whole lot. But um, let's not pretend that it doesn't impose some impact on, on the citizen or the, the community member. No, I understand what you're saying. Thank you. I'm going to pass now to Mike, Vice Chair. Chair, thank you very much, Richard. Thank you very much for, for, for your engagement. And just for transparency, I'll declare friendship with Richard, but it doesn't, to my mind, in any way represent a conflict of interest. So, R Richard, I mean, in, in terms of whether you would encourage us to be pragmatic or you know to take a very principled attitude it sounds to me like you're going with 
with the former. No, when you said there's no solutions, there are only trade-offs. Um, that if you remove certain issues from the need for political decisions, it's a good thing and a bad thing. So, be pragmatic is your is your advice. Uh, I think be pragmatic would be a good general principle for Northern Ireland overall, um, if I could say so. Um, <laughs> so th this is probably no exception. Okay. Last last week with the Lord Chief Justice, we we talked about the danger of the the judiciary becoming politicised, which you've mentioned as a as a potential threat. Uh, and, and we were remi reminded of the, the famous Daily Mail headline in 2016, you know, enemies of the people, the three High Court judges. But I think Sir Declan took the view that, well, that could well happen. It didn't really matter because as judges you were above being influenced by that sort of commentary. Well, yeah, I mean... That Daily Mail headline had a sort of predecessor. I don't know if you remember this bycatcher affair. It was, I think, a similar headline, which was You Fools. And they printed pictures of judges up with their heads upside down for having uh, granted an injunction against um, Peter yeah. Wright's book. So it was in that kind of tradition of sort of knockabout abuse of the judiciary. Um, I think generally, yes, of course, uh, judges do ignore that at one level. Um, uh, but on the other hand, it is somewhat corrosive, um, uh, and it's unfortunate. And I think it's sort of, I think it's, I think it involves a fairly basic misunderstanding of how the legal system works, uh, especially in the UK, where it's you know, if Parliament doesn't like the outcome of a court case, uh, Parliament has a lot more options to change the law than, let's say, the uh, the uh, Rochus has in the twenty six counties, um, but. Just because I think by politicise the judiciary, I think I, I mean that in a slightly different sense to what you're talking about. I don't mean being influenced by headlines. Uh, what I mean is that if the if judges are going to be deciding on uh, what amounts to a basic level of income, say, uh, and therefore indirectly determining levels of tax and social welfare and so forth, then that creates a different kind of judiciary and it creates a different type of um, of selection process almost, because the um, the uh, executive would have a legitimate interest in um, being able to say, well, we want judges who want to be uh, very progressive and very left-leaning, or alternatively, we want, we want judges who will be very um, uh, parsimonious and right-leaning. So. It politicizes the judiciary in that kind of broader sense that it, it, it has the judiciary kind of opining on, on what are essentially political questions. And they're very poorly equipped to do that, I think. Which leads me, leads me to this thought, Richard. I mean, you, you're saying the courts are unpredictable and better at commutative than distributive justice. Yeah. Which could be an argument to say, if you have a bit of rights, you need a dedicated specific court, like a constitutional court, to deal with these matters, to, to, to build up the expertise. But then the danger would be that perhaps that pool of judges becomes like the Supreme Court judges in America. You, yes, you could make that argument. I think in the UK system, I'm not sure it would matter a huge amount. Um, uh, in other words, the UK Supreme Court is a constitutional court of sorts anyway. Um, uh, but judges being unpredictable, I often think of Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights. When that was signed, a right to a private and family life, uh, nobody anticipated that it would be used by judges in Strasbourg to say you can't deport somebody because um, by removing them from the country you're interfering with their right to a private life that they built up uh, while they were here. So that was a very un unanticipated development. And as soon as you adopt any Bill of Rights, you're giving some court, whether it's a constitutional court or whatever kind of court it is, doesn't really matter. But you're giving a court at some undefined point in the future the right to interpret that to mean um, whatever it, it wants to mean. Now, in the case of Strasbourg, that's a major um, issue because there, is no, there are no checks and balances. Uh, there is very little the UK can do about an adverse Strasbourg decision um, uh, that can't be got around by legislation. Some of them can be. Uh, but if it can't be, there's not much uh, that can be done. You have to live with it. Uh, there's no parliament to overrule them and so on. 
Um, so uh, that's why checks and balances have a, have a value, because if there's no check and no balance, uh, judges um, won't have anything uh, holding them back in terms of reading the provision in, in a, a more expansive way at some future point. Um, I, look, the short answer, sorry, that's a very long answer. The short answer is I don't think establishing a constitutional court as such will be a guarantee of slowing down the creativity of uh, judges in interpreting a bill of rights. Um, the only thing that would really slow them down would be some form of um, some form of checks and balances. Uh, how exactly that would work, um, I don't know. And you would probably have to factor in international uh, legal rights standards as well, but they're evolving the whole time too. Um, this again takes us back to maybe the, you know the the kind of core of the business, which is what would you know what would make Northern Ireland a, a more happy place in itself and help people live together as as friends and neighbours um, uh, to the maximum extent. And there, I think you have much less risk of the courts going off on kind of mad solo runs. Uh, if you have the general principles of equality and parity of esteem, non-discrimination and so forth, um, it's probably going to be a good thing if the courts interpret those in a, in a wide way. Uh, now, admittedly, there are very sensitive issues around culture and so forth, but um, you probably don't want to talk about that right now. <laughs> but um, uh, they can all be dealt with, I think. Uh, I really think they can all be dealt with. Richard, when you talk about fundamental duties, are you talking about duties that, that would apply to the state and the agencies of the state? Or could we also write in fundamental duties that we place on citizens of the country? Okay. Well, I, I'm talking about duties on the, on the citizen. The reason being this is that there is no difference between a right of an individual and a duty on the state. They're the same thing. Uh, if you have a right, that means the state has a duty not to do something that would interfere with it. So duties, people talk about duties of the state, that's kind of an irrelevancy really to the discussion. It's just another word for rights, okay? The only duties that matter in the context of balancing are the duties of the individual. And what duties are we talking about? Uh, you know, duties to, um, there, there are a couple of duties in the Irish constitution, for example, they don't mean very much loyalty, um, uh, um, loyalty to the uh, state, loyalty and fidelity to the state and the nation. Um, it generally only comes in if people are having their citizenship revoked, but the Supreme Court's just decided that the law on revocation of citizenship is a breach of rights, so that's gone. Um, so I'm not sure what the constitutional duties that are left are. But you could think about it in terms of duty to comply with the law, duty to respect the rights of others, duty to pay your taxes. Um, uh, you know, duty to, comp to um, well, obviously observe the criminal law and not to endanger the security of the state and uh, uh, respect the borders of the state and so forth. I mean, some countries, some of the African countries have constitutional duties in their constitution. Some of the Eastern European countries uh, do. I think Estonia, uh, some of the other um, Baltic countries, I think, have developed lists of constitutional duties as well as rights. But the answer to your question is, it's, it's meaningless to talk about duties on the state, because that, that's just another word for individual human rights, just looked at from a different perspective. Um, if you want a balance, uh, and the balance is relevant to restrictions on rights, of course, you know, rights aren't a loaded gun to be fired by the rights holder at will. Um, they have to be exercised in accordance with law and subject to uh, restrictions that can be imposed by law um, that are proportionate. Um, so the only that's where duties come in to some extent. And the only duties that matter in that discussion are the duties on the individual, which is a very underdeveloped law, area of law, I think, on both parts of the island, maybe even in the UK as a whole. Final question, Richard, if I may, uh, with regard to enforceability or judiciability. Uh, it's been suggested to us that in terms of, for example, judicial reviews, you could have a sunrise clause that says you can't bring a JR for five years. Uh, would that kick in the legal maxim, justice delayed? Is justice denied? Uh, it, it might, yeah. I mean, I mean, if you, I mean, 
if you believe in the concept of rights, I suppose, why would you want a law that interfered with people's rights to be able to stand for a certain number of years? Uh, it doesn't make a huge amount of sense. In the South, we have this clause in the Constitution that if a bill is referred to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court says it's okay, you can't challenge it again. You can't actually challenge it again uh, 50 years later, even if everything has changed fundamentally. Um, so that's, that's a bit of a flaw. Now, there are ways around it. If the Constitution has been amended, you can argue that the amendment has um, changed the position. But if the Constitution hasn't been amended, um, it's not challengeable. So that's, that's definitely... There are very few flaws in drafting terms in the 1937 Constitution, but in fact, that, that wasn't even in the Constitution as adopted. It was put in later. Um, but I would, I would put that down as a flaw if on the principles of human rights protection. So I don't think a sunset clause... Um, or a prote limited protection is a great idea, really, just as a matter of principle. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Chair. All right, Mike. Paula? Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, you mentioned there is a, as an option or proposal would really to be bring forward a discussion paper, and, and you say we've been here before, and certainly we have been here before um, many times, and this, is, this discussion's been rumbling on now for 20-plus years. Uh, and my concern would be, first of all, some, I, I raised the issue with the Lord Chief Justice last week around it was Carers' Rights Day, um, for example, and and it's uh, and it's not it's not that it's easy, but it, it's common for people to say, oh, there's no support, there's no our rights aren't upheld. Different sections of society, whether it's mental health campaigners or carers or disability, um, and and whilst and and I think it, they think it, the the issue you point out there was that judges and the courts don't have access to all the information. Neither, neither, neither do the people who say that their rights are, being, are not being upheld, and neither do the people who are potentially representing them as in solicitors or barristers. So um, my concern is, is in some ways that the courts aren't necessarily the right place to meet the actual needs of the individuals, whether they're carers or people with disabilities, and that it really should come back to us as, default, as a default administration to make sure that the policies are correct. So I'm nearly talking myself out of why you would have a Bill of Rights. So yes. how, how would you respond to that? Sorry, and the I last thing, sorry, the last thing I'll add is that the Lord Chief Justice said, do not make non judicial promises in a Bill of Rights. In other words, don't promise, like the section of society, like carers, that you can meet all their needs because we might not be able to do that through a Bill of Rights. I know. Well, we have that in the Constitution in the South. The Article 45 has various sort of socio-economic rights, which are not... It's not that they're not justiciable, but you can't strike down laws based on them, so they don't really amount to very much. Um, no, I think you've made a very valid point. Um, you know, the way a court case works is you've got a couple of parties, two normally. Uh, one side says something, the other side replies, and the court decides whatever the legal issue is, sometimes the factual issue. Uh, parliamentary decision making is completely different, as you point out. You know, you've got there's interested um, uh, parties and interest groups and so forth. You look at a range of options. You've got research tools, and uh, you know you can consider a wide variety of material. So it's it's a completely different process, and it's one that judges just you know are are not they're just not equipped for either in my part of the island or I think in in any other part of these islands. Um, uh, so you, you would need to think it very, through very carefully um, before you would give that kind of a, a jurisdiction, I think. Okay. I, I think there wouldn't even be enough court time, maybe even just to go back over how um, different policies Well, I suppose they can appoint more judges, which I think they did when the Human Rights Act uh, came in. But um, uh, I wouldn't worry too much about the court time. I mean, I'd, I'd more, I'm more concerned as a matter of principle. In other words, our common law judges really geared up and um, able, really, mm. to make these kind of socio-economic, quasi-political judgments. And I would say generally not. Mm. Um, generally not, because they're so confined to looking at who's before them, and they're so bad at considering the rights of people who aren't before the court. Yeah. As, um, and the second question relates to the Private Members' Bill, which is going... It's in consideration stage, scrutiny stage, in the Arachnids around the dying with dignity bill. I'm not yeah. sure whether you've come across it yet. Uh, well, I know something about okay. it, not a whole lot. Yeah. Okay. Well, well um, section seven of it um, says that it would be applicable to the island of Ireland. Yes. 
So on health committee earlier today, I said, look, can we get a readout as to what that actually, what our health department are doing looking at this? But anyway, in the context of this, I was thinking about, you know, that would be a very fundamental right, or that would, you know, very, very much cut to the um, the um, central core of a constitution in Ireland, and we'll probably have a citizens' assembly if it gets much further and stuff. So, looking to the future, if we have our bill of rights here. And there could be a complete clash in terms of what you have potentially changed your constitution to in include and what we have up here, but that the clause is not be applicable in Ireland. Have you given any thought to how that could play out in the future? Um, okay, well, <laughs> I, listen, I'll get, I get into trouble if I start commenting on bills before okay, the, okay. Uh, the Irish legislature, so I can't comment on that particular okay. bill. Um, uh, as regards the general principle of... Um, a conflict and so forth. Um, well, I, I w again, I wouldn't worry too much about that. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, you know, if one were to speak in broad generalities, it's nice to have cooperation across the islands where where possible. But uh, it doesn't happen very much um, uh, compared to the way what could be the case. People generally go their own way. Uh, so be it. I wouldn't lose too much sleep about it in this yeah. kind of context. Uh, you've got to come up with something that works for Northern Ireland. Um, uh, and I think um, if your question is about extraterritoriality, um, you, you know, that's a very interesting question. It actually came up at the time of the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, the Irish Constitution was amended to insert a clause allowing the uh, Oireachtas to legislate with extraterritorial effect in accordance with international law. Mm -hmm. um, so I think as long as as long as different legislatures uh, keep within the requirements of international law when they legislate extraterritorially, presumably there won't be any meaningful conflict to speak of in international law terms. Okay, I, th I think my point was, wasn't necessarily the, that constitutional issue per se, but it was just more the fundamentals of human rights in terms of life and death. I think that was more my concern, is how fundamental this could actually change things. But No, I, sure. I I but no, that raises a broader issue, which is that, I mean, human rights are, are not, you know, they're not a kind of fi absolutely fixed standard. They evolve over time. And uh, it is perfectly okay for different jurisdictions to take a slightly different view mm -hmm. as to whether something specific is a right or to what extent. Uh, Strasbourg has this practice whereby they and the uh, US Supreme Court does the same thing with the states. You know, they go around the 50 states and say, well, 48 of them have banned execution of minors, so therefore we're going to say that's cruel and unusual punishment, for example. And Strasbourg does something vaguely similar where they say, well, the member states, the Council of Europe now preponderantly prohibit X, Y, or Z, and therefore we, you know, we're taking this into account and holding that comes within the convention. But um, you know there are critics of that methodology. It's it's not automatic that just because a majority of jurisdictions do something uh, that it constitutes a human right. Um, there has to be some room for variety and differences of opinion. And if something isn't a right, it's in the realm of politics. So by definition, you can have different outcomes. So that has to be part of the equation, uh, to some extent, anyway. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. No problem. Michelle? Yes, thank you. And apologies for missing the beginning of your um, your presentation. I suppose what's actually very welcome about this today is the fact that you're also presenting pros and cons, which I think we've missed um, from um, previous um, presenters and witnesses. Uh, Again, I, I missed um, the commentary in relation to um, the point where you make that currently the demand for a Bill of Rights is not evenly balanced across the community, and that's something that we've heard um, before. Um, and I was wondering whether, in, in order to address that, um, would the approach be more towards looking at a minimalist approach rather than a maximalist approach, um, and just your, your views on that? Um. I, I think the short answer is probably yes, um, uh, in the sense you have to start somewhere. So uh, let's start with the let's start with the common ground, which by definition is going to be more on the on the minimalist rather than the maximalist end. But I think um, it, what I what I um, it said about the list of cons is that you know the list of cons is longer than the list of pros for sure. But that that in itself isn't determinative. Um, I think let's discuss them and go through them. And um, uh, there's got to be something in it for everybody. That's for sure. Uh, you know, it can't be a kind of a wish list for 
uh, any kind of one set of, of points of view. You know, it's got to be seen as something that benefits everybody. And it's got to be something that's reciprocal as well. In other words, that if and insofar as there's kind of um, protection for uh, one section of the community, then there's a kind of corresponding uh, mirroring protection for um, the other section uh, and the, and the uh, non-aligned. Um, so, um, look, you know, if I was to, if you want to be pragmatic about it, I mean, you'd have to start with the, the, the more minimalist end and the common ground. But I do want to introduce into the discussion at least the possibility, not necessarily today, not necessarily tomorrow, but at some point um, of a Northern Irish uh, uh, Constitution Act um, that, would, that would bring all of the Northern Irish Constitution all together. It seems to me there's clearly something in that for, um, for unionism. And um, there's potentially something in it for um, nationalism as well, um, and for others, uh, if it provides a mechanism whereby um, there can be seen to be kind of balance uh, between all the various kind of issues that are of interest to people. So um, the short answer, I think, is you're probably right. Okay. And you're, you're, you seem to have been critical of this idea of crowdsource constitution or mini crowdsource constitution, particularly in relation to referenda and so on. Is that something that we should be avoiding? And, then, and what are the alternatives to that? I think you should be realistic about it. Um, crowdsourcing the constitution or picking people at random off the electoral register isn't going to solve all your problems, for sure. Um, so I, would, uh, I, 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 mean, I don't want to be critical in the sense look, these things are worth a try, but I just don't think uh, I, I just don't think you should be over optimistic about what they're going to achieve. Um, what should you be looking at? Um, as I say, I would make progress slowly. I would I would consult widely. I would start with the very basic issue of principle: uh, what is this whole thing meant to achieve? Um, you know, you're not going to just invert a comma sell a finished product uh, to the community if if people haven't been sold on whether the whether they even want to buy it or not, let alone what its features are. Um, so, uh, why are why are you know why are we doing this? Um, what's it going to do for Northern Ireland? I mean, these kind of very basic questions have got to be sort of got out there. Um, I think the what comes in, what goes into it comes a little bit later. But look, no, anything you can do to widely consult on that um, has got to be a plus. And you are doing a lot. And, you know, I think that's all great. Um, um, but just don't expect the consultation to solve your problems. Uh, I think if you frame options and put out the options, and uh, having sort of had a general and open consultation, if you then kind of define the issues a bit more tightly and sort of put it out, well, here are the three basic models or something like that, get a more kind of nuanced type of feedback, that would be kind of my suggestion. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Michelle, we'll pass now to the members that we have on Starleaf. Um, I don't see any hands raised, so I'll go alphabetically. Mark, do you have any questions you want to ask? Uh, thank you, Chair, and, and thanks for the presentation. Very interesting. Again, I certainly wouldn't expect the consultation to, to, to solve our problems. It'll probably give us a few more, if anything. But I, I certainly do see merit in the idea of that second paper, if you like, that pros, pros and cons uh, to, to discussion paper, post-consultation even. But one of the things that appeared in, in, in your list of both pros and cons was the removal of certain issues from political decision making. I wonder if maybe you could expand on that and maybe touch on whether that would or is an issue everywhere. Would it be particularly more pronounced here, uh, given the, the, the nature of our society and certainly the nature of our government? Um, well, I mean, the sort of thing I was thinking about, I, I mean, I suppose I, I didn't want to sort of hugely get drawn on the whole kind of language rights and cultural rights issue, but it's probably not a bad example of what I'm talking about, because this kind of came up, obviously, as, as a major stumbling block um, during the, the recent period of uncertainty. And people who were saying, look, uh, these are rights we're talking about, and they made the same argument on marriage equality as well, of course. Uh, we're talking about rights here, 
Um, uh, and so the, these therefore become kind of preconditions to political progress. Once you define something as a right, you're saying, well, the other side doesn't have a, any entitlement to kind of negotiate this down or nuance it or qualify it. Um, uh, so it kind of removes it from the sphere of sort of compromise and negotiation. Now, sometimes that's a good thing. And, um, you know, I suppose if I have to say from a kind of Southern perspective, I think the whole cultural language thing is totally overblown. Uh, if you look at the history of Irish language on the island of Ireland, um, the PUL side of the house were champions of the Irish language for a very long time, pioneers. Uh, Bishop Bedell, for example, was the first person to translate the uh, Bible into, into um, Irish, the Church of Ireland, uh, Bishop of Kilmore. So, um, you know, for me as a Southerner, it's a non-issue, and, you know, it's sort of surprising it, it, um, um, that um, it, it became so controversial. But I'm just giving it as an example of when you say something's all right, you are then severely restricting the political space um, in that particular area. So it's just, you know, again, there are pros and cons. Um, uh, and it's just something that needs to be, I suppose, done consciously. Um, uh, uh, that probably doesn't really answer your question, I suppose, does it? <laughs> oh, no, 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 it's, it's, it's not a bad attempt. Uh, Richard, uh, thank you. And then another thing you touched on, I suppose, was the importance of getting input from the next generation. And I don't think the importance of that is lost on any of us, but it, it, it's the methodology, you, you know, it, it, we talk about hard to reach groups and, and the, <laughs> for us as uh, politicians, w with the exception of, of a couple there on the committee, you know, are, are seen as old and grey and, and dull and, 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 it's, and the subject matter, it's heavy stuff, you, you know, but it's how you package it. And, and get young people to engage and see that this is about their futures and, and the future of, of their country. You, you talked there about the, the Magna Carta example. Are, are, are there any other examples you could draw on from elsewhere that have, I suppose, successfully engaged with young people? Well, do you know, I think the, I think the Norwegian government, I think, for the cent bicentenary of their constitution did something similar. They had... Um, they got young people to to provide what they thought the clauses in a new constitution should be. And I think if you were to do something similar, I think young people would probably look at I me, mean, obviously I don't speak for um, the next generation by definition, but um, I think the environment would probably feature very heavily and protecting our planet and, and the climate emergency. Um, and I think this is where, uh, now that's not Northern Ireland specific, of course, but on the other hand, it would overlap with um, uh, um, many devolved functions uh, as well. So um, there definitely is a scope for um, uh, uh, the assembly to some extent in that. Um, uh, this is where I think, thinking beyond maybe a Bill of Rights in the traditional sense, I'm thinking more in terms of kind of a constitutional, a piece of constitutional legislation um, might uh, achieve something. Um, look, no, I accept the point, in other words, that you're not going to get detailed engagement on the kind of trade-offs and justiciability and all that kind of stuff. Um, but what you will get is identifying topics and uh, principles, uh, high-level principles. Um, uh, you know, the right to online safety, for example, uh, not to be bullied. Um, uh, that kind of stuff is, I know, that, you know, I mean, again, that's something that has been legislated on to some extent. Um, but those those sort of issues are uh, the sort of things I think young people will be keen to see. Um, so look, I'd encourage you generally uh, to be creative and imaginative and uh, try new options and experiment and not stick to just the way things were done before or the way they're certainly not the way they're done in the South, um, not necessarily even the way they're done in, in Britain. Um, you know, you can, uh, there is no fantastically great model for this kind of thing. So you can be world beating and you can be imaginative and new. So I think, you know, the more ideas in the mix, the better uh, and pick what works. Well, super Richard, thank you. We'll pick what we hope works. <laughs> John, I'll go to you now.
I, I'm okay, Chair. All, all the points have been covered. Uh, thank you, Richard, for your presentation. No problem. Thanks very much. Well, Richard, you can take your ease now. I think you're you're staying with us for um, Professor Dixon's presentation. Is that right? If that's okay, yes. Of if, course, he, yeah, He's, of he's course. always an excellent speaker. So, look, thank you very much for having me. It was a real pleasure. No. And I, I hope it's of some help. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, members, we'll go now to um, item number three in our agenda, and we have a presentation um, from Professor Bryce Dixon, who is joining us via Starleaf. I'm not sure if he's, he's been moved up to the spotlight. Oh, he is now. Um, Bryce Dixon is an emeritus professor at the School of Law in Queen's University. Uh, in 1999, he was appointed the Chief Commissioner of the Human Rights Commission here, and he was in that position in 2005. And you'll find the clerk's memo and Professor Dixon's written submission um, beginning at page 34 of your packs. So, Professor Dixon, I'd like to welcome you to the meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us this afternoon and thanks for the submission that you provided us with. If you want to begin your briefing. Yes, oh, OK. Thank you, Chair. And, and thank you to the committee for uh, inviting me to give evidence today. Um, uh, you've mentioned that you've received my paper um, which is quite lengthy, I'm afraid. Uh, I'm just going to summarise it over the course of the next 10 minutes, uh, if, if that's all right. Of course. So um, the paper is entitled um, Getting to Yes on a Bill of Rights. Um, and that's because I think that unless your committee chooses a path which is different from the one which is already well trodden by the Human Rights Commission, by the Forum on a Bill of Rights, for example, you won't be able to reach an agreement on what a Bill of Rights should say, and you won't be able to put proposals to the UK government, which it will be willing to accept. Uh, many of the witnesses you've heard from to date have argued for a, a very comprehensive Bill of Rights. Uh, I'm not in that camp, although I did, I did used to be, I have to admit. Um, I, I now think that as far as the Bill of Rights is concerned here, uh, less would be more. And by that I mean more in the sense that uh, a shorter Bill of Rights would stand a much higher chance of actually being enacted. Uh, and that's because the, the harsh political reality is that the UK Parliament is not going to enact a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland if doing so means that people in Great Britain would then have fewer human rights than people here, especially fewer social and economic rights. Uh, and likewise, the Belfast Agreement requires the Irish government, and this is often forgotten, uh, to enact legislation in the Republic to match whatever is contained in the Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland. The Irish government is therefore I would suggest also unlikely to approve of a Bill of Rights for here if it's to contain rights which the government in Ireland doesn't want to extend to people in the South. Uh, now there must have been a reason I think why according to your terms of reference as set out in the New Decades New Approach document you were asked to consider a Bill of Rights that is quote faithful to the stated intention of the 1998 agreement. Unquote. Uh, that phraseology was, I, I strongly suspect, chosen uh, as a not so subtle intimation that a Bill of Rights is much more likely to gain cross party agreement here as well as government agreement in London and Dublin if it is tailored much more closely to the rights issues that were referred to in the Belfast Agreement but which have not yet been fully dealt with either through the Human Rights Act or through other legislation. So in that context, I think it's instructive to return to the response which the UK government gave to the advice issued by the Human Rights Commission back in 2008. The then Labour government rejected most of the Commission's proposals because it thought they went beyond what was particular to Northern Ireland and trespassed into areas relevant to the rest of the UK. But the government did think that there was room for accepting some of the Commission's proposals. In fact, there were five areas for which the government was prepared to consider legislation. And they were, firstly, 
equality, representation and participation in public life. Secondly, identity, culture and language. Thirdly, sectarianism and segregation. Fourthly, victims and the legacy of the conflict. And fifthly, criminal justice. Now, those are all issues which can be traced back to the Good Friday Agreement. And I think your committee should look at them again and try to work out how they could be best be dealt with in a Bill of Rights. In 2009, the UK government seemed already prepared to include three particular rights in a Bill of Rights from the list of issues that I've just mentioned. And they were, first of all, the right to equality before the law, the right of the people of Northern Ireland to identify as British, Irish or both, and the right to fair electoral systems here. In my own paper, I've provided extracts from existing legislation which you could draw upon to fashion appropriate provisions on the other issues listed by the government as worthy of consideration. The examples I've cited are taken from Northern Ireland's own statute book, from legislation, which applies only in Great Britain, from constitutional provisions in Germany and South Africa, and from human rights treaties such as the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and the European Framework, Con Framework Convention for the Protection of National Minorities. Now, in case your committee remains nervous at the prospect of basing provisions in the Bill of Rights on these sorts of precedents, um, I, I want to note that many of the precedents don't actually confer rights on individuals at all. Rather, and this picks up a bit of what Judge Humphreys was saying, uh, they impose duties on public authorities. And, and not all legal duties automatically mean that individuals have then the right to claim a personal remedy if, if a duty is not fulfilled. As you'll know from the report on economic and social rights that you considered last month, um, which was mainly prepared by members of the Human Rights Centre at Queen's, including myself, uh, many kinds of rights can be protected by means other than making them justiciable by individuals in court. And um, at paragraph 34 of my paper, I've been so bold as to suggest a couple of provisions which could be included in a Bill of Rights to help ensure that at the governmental level at least, steps are taken to promote reconciliation, tolerance, mutual respect and mutual understanding, shared and integrated education and housing, the development of communities, the advancement of women in public life and adherence to the principles of mutual respect for the identity and ethos of both communities and parity of esteem. And one or two of the suggestions made in the Human Rights Commission's 2008 advice uh, are helpful in this context as well. So um, to my mind, those are the sorts of issues which should be provided for in a Bill of Rights. They're very particular to Northern Ireland, given that we are a deeply divided society. Providing for them would give reassurance and confidence to everyone who lives here. And indeed, if the Assembly were to back such provisions, it would send out a very positive signal that the politicians we elect can at times come together to do something really positive to help make, help make this a better place in which to live. And a Bill of Rights of that nature would stand a much greater chance of attracting the support of the two governments. The supplementary rights I have, I have suggested could be enacted at Westminster in the form of a Human Rights Northern Ireland Act. And that act could provide that when read together with the Human Rights Act of 1998, it constitutes the Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland as provided for in the Belfast Agreement. The additional rights which the Human Rights Commission and others want to see protected in Northern Ireland, many of which I personally support, but which are not really particular to the North, could then be protected by the Assembly as and when the opportunities arise. 
The Assembly has already demonstrated its desire to protect human rights by exercising its own legislative competence. It has done so, for instance, in the fields of bullying in schools, cooperation in providing children's services, addressing the needs of people living in rural areas, and um, even as we speak, enhancing the rights of victims of domestic abuse. In the New Decade New Approach deal, one of the executive's five priorities is said to be the delivery of a fair and compassionate society. Uh, to me, that sounds like a human rights approach to policy making, especially as the document then goes on to promise benefits such as an anti-poverty strategy, robust actions for ending sectarianism, a target for social and affordable home starts, the extension of welfare mitigation measures, and a strategy on child care. It can hardly be argued, therefore, that the executive is against the very idea of human rights. So my view is, let the Assembly get on with protecting human rights without waiting for those rights to be enshrined in the Bill of Rights passed at Westminster. In fact, whether human rights are protected at Westminster or by the Assembly makes little practical difference on the ground. And after all, the whole point of devolution is to allow devolved regions to take the responsibility for governing themselves. That's the path which, as you've heard from other witnesses, Scotland and Wales have taken, and I think Northern Ireland should take the same path. Uh, and finally, uh, my paper refers to threats to human rights potentially thrown up by the EU exit process. Uh, and my view is that so long as Article 2 of the Protocol on Ireland slash Northern Ireland in the Withdrawal Agreement is faithfully adhered to, there shouldn't really be any such threats. Some provisions true in the UK Internal Markets Bill could possibly uh, pose a risk but um, they should become irrelevant if a trade deal is agreed in the coming days or weeks, as, as we all hope will be the case. So, um, Chair, that's my summary. Um, um, thanks for listening. Thank you very much, um, Professor Dixon. And as you pointed out yourself, the written presentation that you gave us was lengthy, but very interesting, and you, you covered everything in, in great detail. One of the points that you make, and... Um, I suppose both yourself and um, Mr Humphreys had mentioned the, the constitutional situation. I always almost feel um, it's strange that I'm not the person bringing the, this up. Um, as, as a Sinn Féin MLA, obviously my position on this would be, would be clear. But you just mentioned the support shown, particularly in the context of 2020 and the COVID-19 pandemic, towards the NHS and our healthcare workers. And obviously there have been a lot of goodwill um, towards healthcare workers and, and everything that they went through this year, notwithstanding the, the vote in the doll last last night, but uh, that's that's a separate issue. But you, you then draw on the fact that the support for the NHS from the general population would suggest that very few people would object to healthcare as a right included in a Bill of Rights. And I just wondered if I could could um, get more detail on your, on your thinking there. Yes, well, I mean, the, the reality is, though hardly anybody admits this, that there already is a right to health care, not just in Northern Ireland, but throughout the UK. And in fact, it's a right to health care free at the point of delivery. Um, there's a, a constitution of the National Health Service which guarantees that right. There isn't a statute or any constitutional provision that guarantees it, but the the long and the short of it is that the law of Northern Ireland already protects the right to free health care. There are some minor exceptions, unfortunately, as regards um, asylum seekers. But uh, for the vast majority of the people living here, whatever their, their political background, whatever their belief, um, they do have that right already. So it would be a very small thing to do for either the UK Parliament or indeed the Assembly to enact in legislation the right to free health care. It's already, it's already there. Likewise, um, people talk about the need for 
education rights, there is already in our domestic law the right to education up to the age of 16, at least, and the right to, to training thereafter. So it would be a small thing to include any such existing right in in a bit of rights, if you like. Um, so uh, that, that answer doesn't suggest that the right to free health care needs to go into a bit of rights for Northern Ireland. It's, it's, it's confirming, my answer is confirming that the right is already there if it was enshrined in legislation, any kind of legislation. Uh, that would just bring it home to people that, that uh, the current reality. Thank you. And I suppose that what you've just said brings me on to the next point that I have. So we can see in the north over the course of the past year uh, with the legislation of abortion services here or the decriminalisation of abortion services, yet because the services haven't been commissioned by our local health minister, women are not able to access that right, although it, it is enshrined in law as passed by, by Westminster. The other thing that I think of then is rights for transgender people. We have one um, transgender clinic in the in the or gender identity service in the, in the north, and it's at a standpoint and has been so for three or four years now at this point. So whilst on paper the right to healthcare for trans individuals exists, it's not actually happening in reality or in practice because there hasn't been anything bringing trust or health department to account in, in why that service hasn't been delivered. Now, in response to that, the board have said that that's a resource issue, that there's not the personnel. But some people have suggested, and and I think that it would probably be my own sort of perception, that where it where, was there an impetus on the, the health minister to prove that efforts had been made to address the situation, that we might have a, a different result for the people that are currently without health care that they need? Well, yes. I mean, in, in my paper, I, I do draw attention to, I think, three examples where courts in Northern Ireland have, um, have ordered ministers to, to basically, basically get on with with what they're legally obliged to do, be it um, provide a anti-poverty strategy or a language strategy or a compensation for, for victims uh, of the troubles. So uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm, you know, in, in theory and, and perhaps in practice, there, there should be um, action taken through the courts to make abortion services available. If, if, if there's a law saying they have to be made available, then a, a, a judge is likely to order the relevant department to, to make such provision. Okay, I think the problem that we have probably here is that it is legal, it has been decriminalised, but there's not that, that motivation. But um, And that's where I suppose this, I see the possibility and the opportunity. Um, from the Bill of Rights. But no, thank you very much, Professor. I'll pass to the Vice Chair now. Chair, thank you very much. Professor, good afternoon. Thanks for engaging with us. Um, You're welcome. I'm, I'm wondering, first of all, because I note you say that, that you're more of a minimalist today than you used to be, and the reasons why. Is it, is it, does it go beyond your kind of pragmatic analysis of, of the possibilities of what we might be able to agree? Probably yes. I'm I'm a strong supporter of human rights because I'm a strong supporter of a a free, fair, and compassionate society, and I think that's what human rights are all about. I, I'm I don't like the term minimalist because it, it suggests that I I um, th think a, a short bit of rights would be unimportant or insignificant. Uh, quite the opposite. I, I see the function of a bill of rights as provided for in the Good Friday Agreement to be. The fulfilment of the function of the Good Friday Agreement itself, which was to bring our divided society together and to allow us all to live harmoniously and peacefully together. Uh, that's, to me, the prime purpose. It's the, that's the added value which a Bill of Rights, as provided for in the Good Friday Agreement, could bring. All the other rights which could be in a Bill of Rights and are in places like Canada and South Africa um, deserve to be protected in Northern Ireland just as much as anywhere else, but they can be protected 
by the Assembly, given the very extensive competences which the Assembly has at its dis- uh, under, the, under the Good Friday Agreement, uh, the Assembly could provide those social and economic rights and other rights if it wished to, in a similar way to, to what Scotland and Wales is proposing to do. I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by your reminder of the, the obligation that the Belfast Agreement places on the Government of Ireland in terms of rights. Uh, And I'm just looking at it again, and it says that the government in Dublin would bring forward measures which would, and I quote, ensure at least an equivalent level of protection of human rights as will pertain in Northern Ireland. Now, I'm I'm assuming that at the time, that was a one-off commitment, thinking that if there was a Bill of Rights, it would come through Westminster. But does it actually apply to laws and statutes passed here at the Assembly, for example, the bullying in schools and the victims of domestic abuse, which you cited? Uh, that, that's an interesting suggestion. Um, I, I don't think it was intended to extend to that, ex- to that extent, I think. Um, in the context in which you find that provision in the Good Friday Agreement, it's relating to the, the rights and safeguards mentioned in the Good Friday Agreement and, and the Bill of Rights idea is, is to be found in that part of the Good Friday Agreement. So it, it's that, I think, which the Irish government is obliged to, um, to, to match if there's a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland. Now, I, I, I can't obviously speak for the Irish government and I know it's been quite supportive of the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission's advice to the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland. Uh, I... I I would suggest that there's a deal of, of rhetoric in that kind of support. If 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 um, if if, uh, if put on the spot, I'm I'm not so confident that the Irish government would be prepared to enact for the South of Ireland all the rights which are currently recommended in the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission's advice. Yeah, if if it was open ended rather than that more specific commitment. And surely the implication would be that the Northern Ireland Assembly could continuously pass legislation which would have an impact on the Republic of Ireland. Well, yes, that, that's a good reason for, for not adopting that interpretation because it's a rather absurd one. And Justice Humphreys made me think of something when we were talking about should we, should we pass a Bill of Rights through the Assembly or through Westminster. If it went through Westminster... And then there was a statute here in Northern Ireland which was to be challenged uh, because it was contradictory to the Bill of Rights. I've always imagined that the challenge would come from an individual or a group or maybe a political party. But could it be the case that Westminster could continuously take us to court? Um, Well, Potentially, yes, the British government could take the Northern Ireland government to court, just like ministers within the Northern Ireland government sometimes take their fellow ministers to court. It's a theoretical possibility. A more likely scenario is that a, an individual or an organisation who thinks that the Northern Ireland Assembly has, has acted in breach of the Bill of Rights, as passed by Westminster, would take the matter to court. Final question, Professor. Uh, Justice Humphreys talked about the Constitutional Act, the Constitution Act. Um, I'm sure it's well beyond the terms of reference of this committee, but I just wonder what, what your thoughts are. Is it something that appeals? Um, I, I'd need to know more um, about what exactly Judge, Judge Humphreys is getting at there. And the reality is that we do already have a constitution of sort. It's the Northern Ireland Act of 1998, which implements the Good Friday Agreement and which has been extensively amended uh, ever since, including as a result of the New Decade, New Approach document. Um, uh, you know, I, I think I think he may, uh, like like a lot of lawyers and judges, um, he he wants the law to be tidy and and accessible and, and all in one place. And, and there's much to be said for that. Uh, you know, as regards the general public's access to the law that's that's important i don't i don't um see much of substance being changed if if what judge humphreys was suggesting 
on his slide in the previous presentation were to be implemented. I don't think that would change much of substance. It's more a, a procedural and um, uh, sort of uh, consolidating um, uh, activity. Okay, Professor, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Paula, thank you. Um, Professor Dixon, thank you. Welcome to committee. Um, in, your, you, in your notes, you um, referenced the fact that the New Decade, New Approach um, document did not include, whereas previous ones did, um, a call for a single equality bill. Um, as, as you'll know from 20 odd years of, of looking into this, the, the biggest proponents for a Bill of Rights will be like sectoral groups, and I don't mean that churlishly, but um, do you think that a single equality bill could probably address a lot of the complaints and the and meet a lot of the aspirations for the likes of the disability sector or care sector, for example, as opposed to a bill of rights? Because I think a single equality bill, we would have greater control over its um, drafting and then implementation here in Northern Ireland. Yes, I, I think there's a great need for a single equality bill, and, and we were to to get one back in 2001, as, as you know, and, and as I've explained in the paper, somehow it's fallen off the radar. And the result is that from being a jurisdiction where equality rights were better protected than anywhere else in these islands, we've now got to a situation where in Northern Ireland equality is less well protected either than in the Republic of Ireland or in England, Wales or Scotland. So uh, without even including it in the Bill of Rights, the, the Assembly could, could turn around tomorrow and suggest a, an equality bill for Northern Ireland, which would at the very least bring us here up to the standards that already exist in Great Britain and, and the Republic. And the Equality Commission on its website has a, a detailed set of recommendations for, the, the, for plugging the gaps which, which currently exist. One of them is already mentioned in the New Decade New Approach document, and that's the need for legislation to protect older people against discrimination in the realm of goods, facilities and services. It exists in relation to employment, but not in relation to other matters. And that, that protection is there in Great Britain and it's there in the Republic, but it's not here. And that's just one example of the, the gaps that have opened up here. So yes, the Assembly should, should get on and enact a single equality bill, in my view. Thank you. Um, and my second question relates to um, the rejection back in 2001 by the former Secretary of State, John Reid, um, of the proposals, the draft proposals, and he very much then looked at the five areas, equality, identity, etc. It, it, to what extent do you think that um, with the passage of time or policies or other legislation we've actually passed here in Northern Ireland, that a lot of the um, deeply divided societal issues that you reference have actually been addressed and that these five sort of areas aren't quite as prevalent and as pressing to, um, as a major factor in, in life here in Northern Ireland? Um, well, they've been addressed to, to some extent. Um, I mean, even the recommendation made by the government that, the, that there be a, a, a right enshrining fair electoral systems, I think, I think our electoral systems are pretty fair at the moment. Um, we've had some legislation on uh, shared education, and we've had some um, legislation on um, the rights of victims, although that took a long time to, to, come, to come about. Um, but we still haven't got the, the rights on equality, which you just mentioned yourself. We still don't have legislation properly dealing with culture and language. Um, We've, we've got the Together Building a United Community strategy, the TBUC strategy, but it's not accompanied by statutory performance measures or indicators that would allow an objective observer to decide whether in fact uh, the Executive Office is fulfilling its responsibilities under that strategy or whether indeed the changes that are being made um, are having any difference at all uh, to the the harmoniousness of our of our society. Uh, we haven't got proper legislation on the right to integrated education. I think that's one of the big the big gaps. I'm afraid it didn't appear in the Human Rights Commission's advice of 2008. Even though, to my mind, anyway, you, you couldn't think of a more particular circumstance to Northern Ireland than the fact that our children are educated uh, in, in in separate schools. So. 
something has been done about those issues, but a lot more needs to be done, I think, Paula. Okay, and um, very quickly and finally, you, you talked about then a shorter Bill of Rights, and uh, I'm just um, proposing then that it would almost codify in law what, what is pretty much there with some add-ons that you've just mentioned, but that it would be more of a symbolic document, you know, with a with quite a descriptive um, preamble then that sort of set the context for where we where we've been and where we're going here in Northern Ireland. What are your thoughts on that? Yes, I, I think that pretty much sums up what I'm suggesting. It, it would have symbolic significance that the people of Northern Ireland, in my view, are crying out for um, some kind of statement from uh, their elected politicians that, that they do have a, a recipe for allowing us to live harmoniously together and uh, in a free, fair and just way. And that's without any regard to the constitutional status of this place. It doesn't matter what um, flag we live under. What matters is the, are the conditions under which we live. And a Bill of Rights, in the way that I've suggested, picking up the, the topics that were mentioned in the Good Friday Agreement and in subsequent agreements, such as the St Andrews Agreement, would, would go a long way to reassuring people, giving them confidence that um, the troubles are over, that the peace is solid, uh, we will continue to have governance here that is of a high quality um, and that um, our, our, our basic rights are protected. Um, over and above that, the Assembly can, can do a lot more. Um, but as far as the Good Friday Agreement requirements are concerned, that the former is what's more, more urgent, I think. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. Okay, Paula. So we'll go now to the members that are. You don't have a question? I'm okay, thank you. It's covered, thanks. I, I thought you said that. So I'll go now to Mark. Oh, thank you, Chair. No, I have no questions for Bryce, but just to, to thank him for his input there. Thank you, Bryce. Thank you, Mark. John, what about yourself? John, you're muted. Yeah, sorry, Chair, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, maybe more a comment than a question, but thank you, Bryce, for your presentation and also for the written document you sent to the committee. Surely the best way for society to realise that the conflict is over, that we have stable government and that politics can work, and I think there's a strong indications on all those factors, I have to say, um, we have dragged ourselves out of conflict. Politics is a very, very difficult uh, arena uh, at the best of times, but given our history, it's a more difficult arena here. But we, 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 we despite ourselves at times, we prove that politics can work. But there's a responsibility here on the two co-guarantors of the Good Friday Agreement, the British government, and the best way to stabilise any peace process is to honour the peace agreement that brought the peace process into being. And given the fact that the British government have failed to implement a Bill of Rights, uh, it, it is a fundamental flaw in that process. And while I, I, as a local elected representative, carry huge responsibility, um, on this occasion, a lot of the responsibility rests with the co-guarantor of the agreement. Um. Well, first of all, you're suggesting that the Good Friday Agreement mandated a Bill of Rights. It didn't. It, it asked the Human Rights Commission to give advice on what might be in a Bill of Rights and then left it up to the UK government to decide whether to go ahead and enact any such Bill of Rights. But the second and perhaps more fundamental point is that as an MLA, you yourself and all your colleagues are in a position to guarantee many of the rights that you want to see in a Bill of Rights enacted by the British Parliament. Uh, I, I'm a bit surprised in general that, uh, that nationalists are prepared to hand over to the UK Parliament the uh, decision-making power over what should be in a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland whenever the Assembly itself has the competence to protect rights in all sorts of areas already. Yes, uh, but well, in, in relation to your first response, uh, 
and there's a lot, there's a high court judge in the room, so I'm not going to contest law at the moment. But there's the spirit of the law and the written law, uh, and the spirit of the Good Friday Agreement was accepted by all that the British government would legislate for for a bill of rights. And in regards, and trust me, if the, if the Westminster Parliament wishes to devolve to uh, the Assembly international treaties, I will gladly take it on board. So I will. But there's international treaties which the British government and the Westminster have competency in, which the Assembly doesn't have competency in, which is why the call has been made to Westminster uh, to legislate in regards to a Bill of Rights, to make it a comprehensive uh, Bill of Rights, which is more the more important, considering now that we are withdrawing uh, from the EU and the stated intention of this current government uh, to withdraw from the human, International Human Rights Act. So that, that's why it's with Westminster. Well, I don't think you're right on that, John. Um, I mean, the reason why places like Scotland and Wales can do what they're doing as regards, say, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child is because they're the legislation devolving powers to them allows them to implement international treaties which the British government has ratified in a way that Scotland and Wales want to do. And the legislation devolving power to the Northern Ireland Assembly gives it exactly the same powers. So you could enact, you could make the UN, UN Convention on the Rights of the Child part of the law of Northern Ireland if, if you can persuade your fellow MLAs to do that. And in regards to other international treaties, does the Assembly have the competency to bring about a comprehensive Bill of Rights as was envisaged by the Human Rights Commission report? It has the power to incorporate into the domestic law of Northern Ireland any human rights that are in the international treaties which the UK has ratified. And many of the provisions in the Human Rights Commission's advice pick up on the, uh, the human rights provisions in, in the treaties. So that, for example, the provisions in the Framework Convention for the Protection of National Minorities, which Dermot Nesbitt talked about and which I've mentioned as well, um, th those could be incorporated into the domestic law of Northern Ireland if the Assembly wants to do so. OK, thank you. Thank you. No problem, John. That's all our, our members having a, a chance to ask a question. So, um, Professor Dixon, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. And you can take your ease at this point. Yeah, thanks very much, Chair. Thanks for having me. Thank you. OK. So, members, the next item on our agenda is Chairperson's Business, and we don't have any. And we then have the draft minutes from last week, if members are satisfied. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Read them. We've got no correspondence, and members, you can find the Forward Work Programme, Agenda Item 8, at page 159 of your pack. We've got the schedule for the next couple of weeks. If anyone has any other business? Oh, no. No? I'm just wondering, um, it's probably more for the committee clerk, in terms of you know, how many more of these sort of sessions do we think after? We've got 3 to February here, in terms of, of what we then start pulling together the evidence session and start sort of reviewing it and churning it over and start looking at something, looking back instead of keep looking forward and outwards. Yeah, thanks, Cheryl. I, I would certainly take my lead from members and members are keen to start getting into those sort of consideration of the issues. Um, I could begin to, to draft some um, sort of early reports to, as basis of discussion. Um, I had envisaged maybe having a few more sessions up to about uh, Easter recess, including which would include maybe some stakeholder events, and you would get the, also the results of the consultation, um, and then perhaps have a strategy afternoon just before or after uh, Easter recess, um, where those kind of discussions could take place. But if members wish, you know, I can move that forward. No, I think it's in the context of that session we had with the Human Rights Commission. I know they're coming back for another training session. I just find it so useful to start knitting together. We heard that bit and we heard that and that now makes sense. And that, you know, So I think it's not even as a final, getting into the final consideration stage even, um, but even just as a sort of stock take, you know, where we've done um, weeks and weeks of looking uh, at this and hearing from so many people at this, just think maybe just to 
have a look at where we where we've arrived at and are, are we you know was there commonalities in, in people's aspirations or thoughts on the I way forward? We're taking presentations almost in silos. Yeah. Where it might be useful. We didn't have any response back in terms of the panel, did we? Uh, Chair, no, we've been pursuing that uh, with the Executive Office, but we haven't received a response okay. to date. Um, we have a training session uh, to answer the members' query with the Human Rights Commission um, for the 21st of January, um, so that would also provide bit of scope, but I could schedule in a, a strategy afternoon if members wish there, say, early February. Yeah, that 4th of February slot, yeah, it might be. Yeah. Yeah, I'm happy. Remind, remind me, when's our deadline for publishing a report? Um, Feb 22. Feb 22, yeah. Really a year away, it seems like. I know. That seems like su such a long time. It's not. So, um, we'll get that organised and everyone's happy, yeah? Yeah, appreciate that. Thank you, Chair. Okay, so date time place next meeting, same place, same time next week. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly.